Well, uh, thank you to the Pontific Academy of Sciences for hosting us, and thank you, Joaquim and Marcelo, for partnering on this. I think it has been uh, incredible to work with you on, 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 on the event. Um, so uh, my remarks will focus on Sub-Saharan Africa and a little bit more on uh, realigning uh, the incentives and policies that are required to modernize value chains in order to reduce food loss. Um, and I want to start by uh, bringing a little bit of context and the changing context that the continent is, is going through. Um, if you think about it, for the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have probably between 40 and 50% of the population living above the poverty line. And with that, it creates a great market pool and market demand for a, 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 a food transition, if you wish. And what you are seeing is there is a large demand now for um, value chains or food products that they, are, they go beyond grains. If you look at the import uh, numbers for Sub-Saharan Africa, fruits and vegetables have increased, the import of fruits and vegetables have increased by 300% over the past decade. If you look at oil seeds, they have increased by 600%. So that market and that income that's being generated within the continent is creating that market pool. Now, when you start to look at the per capita numbers, you will see that already Sub-Saharan Africa on a per capita basis is consuming less grains. The consumption of maize is declining on a per capita basis. The consumption of um, millet and sorghum is declining as well. But what you are seeing is also there is a substitution effect. They are moving away from, gra from maize and into wheat and rice. And that is mainly driven in, Sub in, in, in West Africa and by Nigeria. Nigeria, over the past decade, has increased the imports of wheat and uh, rice by 500%, from 500 million to 2.5 billion dollars. That's the amount of wheat and rice that Nigeria is consuming at the moment. So, um, and, and of course, you know, this is uh, driven by uh, an increased urbanized population. If you look at the uh, latest, well, one of the previous um, um, uh, uh, Africa agricultural status reports, you look at cities like Dar es Salaam over the past 15 years, from 2005 to 2015, the population of Dar es Salaam has increased by 85%. The population of Nairobi has increased by 77%. So just imagine about the challenge, and that is changing completely the way that we see demand and markets in the continent. Now, of course, uh, there is a need for us to start to think about how do we realign market incentives and policies for us to modernize these supply chains and for us to be able to reduce food loss and food waste. We have been working on, on projections with uh, IFPRI, and uh, uh, we have, um, um, IFPRI has a BFAP uh, model which prioritizes policies and looks at, you know, what a country should start to look at if they are to achieve an agriculture transformation. And here we are looking at four main outcomes. The first one is economic growth, of course, within the agricultural sector. The second one is a food systems growth. The third one is jobs. The fourth one is nutrition, and the fifth one is gender empowerment. And when you look at the policies, the order changes, but the five main policies are the same in the case of Tanzania. is education, is energy, is research and development in livestock, is extension services, and the fifth one is incentives or subsidies, but in any other value chain but maize. Those are the five, and they change the order. But again, if you think about uh, from a food systems perspective, we know what a government could prioritize, but now is how do we help that government to make those right choices? Now in terms of markets, it becomes 
important for us to start to think about, you know, from a demand perspective, what kind of incentives should be there in place for a consumer to send that signal to the supplier? And what we are seeing in Sub-Saharan Africa is that there is an emergence, and, and that was in the latest Africa Agricultural Status uh, Report, of energy in peri-urban areas. So the Nairobi's, the Addis Abeba's, the Lagos are creating that market pool for the development of and the boom of those SMEs around those markets. IFPRI just published a study a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, for Ethiopia and the dairy sector. And what is fascinating is that you see a specialization of, in production of milk, dairy, around Addis Abeba. And as you move away from Addis Abeba, it starts to change the composition of that basket. And they move away from uh, fresh milk into cheese. And after five hours, they move away completely from dairy and into maize. Because of course, you know, you can, maize you can store, you can transport, it's bulky, I mean, you can store it. So it's fascinating to see that, that kind of, 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 of composition. And you see the same thing in Nairobi, in Lagos, around poultry, around horticulture, around dairy. So there is this incredible energy. So what kind of incentives can we start to think to align not only that consumption with a reduction of loss and, and, and waste? Now, let me make one, uh, one final uh, point in terms of, um, uh, and that's, um, um, Ishmael, uh, back to your point. The latest data that we have from the LSMS is that 80% of the food in Sub-Saharan Africa is purchased. 80% of the food. Yet, we still talk about the smallholder farmer and the food security of that smallholder farmer. So the center of economic mass, given the urbanization and the economic growth, is moving away from rural areas to urban areas. And that is changing completely the way that we see a supply chain. But then there is another discrepancy, and, and I think that's something that we need to address as well, is that Population growth is, still remains in the rural areas. So that becomes a, a, a safety net issue <laughs> and, and a social security issue, if you wish. But again, the center of economic mass is moving to the urban area, to the consumer, and that's triggering all these changes in the supply chains that we are seeing right now. Um, finally, um, uh, you know, this, uh, and I'll stop with this, we are preparing for a, a learning session with Bill Gates uh, in December, and he asked us this question. He says, well, population in Sub-Saharan Africa is going to double by 2050 to two billion dollars. So how are we two going, billion to, sorry, two billion people. Um, so how are we going to feed this, uh, the, the, this growing population? And what is the role of markets and trade? Um, and I think when you start to think about it, you know, 90% of the food is produced locally. 10% is traded. So again, this becomes a very local issue, a very national issue. I mean, there's going to be more trade in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it has to be, you know, these problems need to be solved nationally in terms of policies, in terms of markets, in terms of incentives. So how do we start to think about aligning these different pieces in a way that makes sense? So let me stop there. Thank you.